So at this point, then, I call upon our Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Research and Innovation, Professor Jeffrey Impatlele, to give a word of welcome. Um, thank you very much, uh, Program Director, for your kind words of uh, introduction. And um, uh, distinguished guests, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, 27 years after political emancipation in South Africa, uh, the remnants of apartheid and colonialism are still felt in many sectors uh, of our society. Uh, this lecture is not about the era of political segregation in South Africa. Um, it is about colonialism in higher education in Africa, how colonialism is still entrenched in curriculum and deeply rooted in the minds of some academic staff, uh, its negative impact to academic freedom and um, autonomous proliferation of knowledge economy. It is very much relevant in South Africa given our recent past, uh, but it's not unique to South Africa. It is an African challenge, and certainly it is a global challenge. This is part of the reason today is an International Day of Democracy. Uh, the International Day of Democracy is an opportunity to review the state of democracy around the world. Higher education sector is central in promoting and supporting democratic values and principles all over the world. Prof. Kwacho has been unrelenting in his academic quest of decolonizing higher education in Africa. Although he is championing this cause, he is not alone. Uh, it is a shared responsibility and this requires global solidarity. Prof. Kwajo, my dear brother, Northwest University is so pleased uh, to you uh, that you accepted the invitation to be with us on this special day. Um, it is wonderful to have you in our midst. This invitation is in recognition of your sterling work, time, and also commitment to a future where people would cherish dignity and appreciate the rights of their fellow men in pursuit of academic freedom. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, Prof. Kwajo, uh, who is the Associate Professor in the School of Law, University of Ghana, Accra. North University, Northwest University prides itself with the ethic of care, uh, Prof. Kwajo. Uh, so, with that, we say Akwaba to Northwest University, as you say in Accra. Thank you for changing the course of history and all the best with your lecture. Thank you, our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation. So, Professor Kwaja and myself have been cooperating in three different contexts. Uh, both of us have done work for the Scholars at Risk Network, which is an NGO with its seat in New York. It attends to the plight of those that are persecuted in different countries. It operates a network of universities which may provide refuge to those that are under danger, uh, professors, lecturers in countries facing uh, for example, torture, um, death penalty, arrests, uh, infringements of their freedom of movement. These are the kind of infringements that I would term academic freedom violations 1.0. And we see those in a lot of countries. Fortunate enough, that is not the type of situation that we face in South Africa. We have got different types of challenges in higher education. But uh, we have been working on a project with the Scholars at Risk Network in 2011 where we looked at freedom of movement because it's a problem these days that scholars may often not travel freely, countries denying visas, and 
in many countries such as the USA, a visa may be denied without the provision of grounds. So you can't even challenge that before a court. And the reason for that, often in the case of academics, is the specific views that they espouse. Apart from the Scholars at Risk Network, we have been cooperating in the context of the Magna Carta Observatory. Now, the Magna Carta Observatory is an institution with its seat in Bologna, Italy. It is seated there because Bologna was the, the first modern uh, university after uh, the Renaissance. And it was actually founded subsequent to the formulation of the Magna Carta Universitatum, which is a document at the time signed by essentially European rectors and vice chancellors, and which makes a commitment to academic freedom and institutional autonomy. And there are also two, uh, or maybe I'm not quite sure, but a few universities, South African universities, that have signed on to the Magna Carta Universitatum. And this instrument has actually been revised in 2020. And Kwaju and myself, we have both been, and we still are, what we call ambassadors to the Magna Carta Observatory. So we provide uh, assistance at times, and the idea is eventually to provide actual help to universities around the world in their restructuring so that they can facilitate uh, academic freedom on campus. The third opportunity for us to cooperate arose uh, when we both applied for Marie Curie funding uh, for fellowships to go to the University of Lincoln in the UK. The reason why we went to the UK was that uh, Professor Karens uh, does uh, outstanding work there on academic freedom and Kwaju in his research focused on the protection of academic freedom in the African context, and we will hear more about that. And I focused on the European countries at the time. We both looked at the legal protection, and uh, that research has been published, but we also formulated a survey which we circulated. As for the European survey, we did manage to get quite a number of replies, and the uh, intention is later on to compare various countries and to see what the situation is. Already now, the results prove, for example, that academics often uh, practice self-censorship even in enlightened European countries because of pressures. These pressures are often commercial pressures in universities. And we might see some of this also in uh, South Africa. So when we talk about South African universities, we perhaps have the same kind of criticism that we have for universities in uh, the European or US context. The words mentioned are uh, managerialism, micromanagement, um, governments reigning into universities, making sure universities are part of producing economic growth for uh, society. And um, it is perhaps at that point there where I want to make a link with uh, Professor up here, Jay Artur's uh, lecture today. And here I refer to another great mind from the African continent, that is the Cameroonian uh, philosopher, Akhil Mbembe, who actually, in a speech delivered at Wits University, said that what we need in South Africa is a decolonization of university management. And he says that there has been a reign of uh, statistics, assessments, which actually prevents students and staff from really pursuing the truth. One might perhaps say this form of university management is based on neoliberal ideology, which is a Western concept. So I don't know if that is what Professor Quadro has in mind today uh, when he speaks about decoloniality, also about us getting rid of that form of um, uh, steering universities, or whether he has a much broader concept in mind. But today is not my lecture, it is Professor Quaja's lecture, and at this point I call upon him to deliver his academic freedom 
presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Klaus, for the kind introduction and the links that has brought us back together here at Northwest University. And it's a pleasure and a delight for me to have the opportunity to be invited to deliver the third in the series of lectures on academic freedom. I want to, first of all, indicate that in terms of my outline, I will begin by explaining some terms, specifically coloniality, decolonization, and academic freedom. I'll then proceed to look at the historical evolution of higher education in Africa in very brief terms. And then I'll look at um, three areas of constitution making in Africa, which is linked to the, the recognition of academic freedom in African universities, as well as also look at the decolonization agenda and how um, I understand it or I want to apply it in this lecture. Then I will look at the South African context, because in terms of geohistorical narrative, Afri uh, rest of, the rest of Africa has a process which differs from that of South Africa. And, but I'm going to focus on the fallist movement and then the impact it has had or it should have on the rest of Africa in the decolonization struggle. Then I'll conclude my presentation. So without much ado, when we're talking about coloniality, or in the sense in which I want to locate it in my discussion, coloniality of higher education in Africa refers to the quality of the continent's higher educational system being or remaining colonial. And it therefore has linkages to three types of colonialism which are identified. The first is the physical colonialism, which saw the colonialism um, being imposed on African countries by European states. Then after the decolonization of the continent through the political struggles that were waged in the 50s and 60s, and colonialism ended in, the, in, that, in terms of physical colonialism, the second colonialism emerged. The politicians would call it neocolonialism, but in the context of higher education, we call it the colonization of the mind, which leads to the denigration and decimation of indigenous knowledges, and in turn causes epistemic injustice. Then the third, um, but before I go to the third, I just want to quote Steve Biko, who says, in, the, in connection with the colonization of the mind, that the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So that sort of sums up my understanding of colonial, colonization of the mind. The third is the exercise of vestiges of colonial power by the independent states. The reproduction of this power and the application or endorsement of epistemic violence within the university space. So the third one is quite broad, and in the course of the discussion, we'll try to unpack it and see how it affects higher education in the African context. In a sense, coloniality is used in this context to refer to long-standing patterns of power that ensues from colonialism and contributes to define knowledge production, culture, labor, and intersubjective relations. Then, having looked at coloniality, we want to look at decolonization. Just as there are three types of coloniality, there are three types of decolonization. First is the physical decolonization, which has been achieved um, on, the, on the continent of Africa. Then the second is the decolonization of the mind. And when we are talking about decolonization of the mind, I have four issues in mind. One is the disruption or deconstruction of conventional processes of knowledge production. Second is integration of indigenous knowledge systems. Third is decolonization of the classroom and curriculum. And fourth, democratization of academic freedom. And I will try and look at this in, in a little bit of detail to properly situate this discussion in the context of decolonization of the mind in these four areas. Then when it comes to the third wave of decolonization, we are talking about removal of repressive laws, institutions and structures which were inherited from colonialism 
and which African states have so, f- found it comfortable to retain and to reproduce in order to maintain some colonial practices on African peoples, and which have not only affected the society as a whole, but also in a lot of ways the academic environment in order to suppress dissent and suppress opportunity to, for scholars to challenge orthodoxy and uh, more practices within the political space. Then talking about academic freedom. This is a freedom that is specially carved out for the academic community, which includes the university itself, academics, and students to enable reproduction of knowledge, research, and dissemination of such knowledge. So it is important that academic freedom is connected to the decolonization of the mind process because of the fact that we are dealing with production of knowledge. And therefore, when you're talking about academic freedom, there are four main pillars which uh, would inform the discussion, even though not all of the attention will be paid to all of them for the sake of time. First, we can talk about institutional autonomy, which is the freedom that the university itself is supposed to enjoy to be able to function effectively. Second is self-governance. Third is freedoms for academics and students. And fourth is tenure for academics. More emphasis will be laid on institutional autonomy and then freedoms for academics and students, especially in the context of knowledge production and dissemination. Now, I want us to also take into account these four elements which links democracy and academic freedom. And it's important to note that today is an international, international day for democracy. There's a strong relationship between democracy and academic freedom. And I establish it in, on these four main grounds. First, academic freedom is indicative of democratic values within the larger society. So if you look at uh, um, the, the credentials of a country's democratic record, academic freedom re- reflects in that. So the more democratic a country is, it is more likely that its academic re- freedom record will also be better. Second, without democracy, academic freedom is compromised. So when we don't have democracy, the the opposite is what we have. Academic freedom will suffer. Third, without without democratizing academic freedom, certain members of the academic community will be denied the opportunity to exercise this freedom. So in other words, when we are talking about democratization of academic freedom, we are talking about giving the three actors in the academic freedom space the university itself, the academics, and students the opportunity to practice academic freedom within the university environment and without uh, interference or new interference from governmental and other sources. Fourth, without democratizing academic freedom, democracy in the larger society will suffer. So in other words, where each of the three actors in the academic freedom equation is denied the opportunity to exercise its academic freedom, the larger society will not be the beneficiaries of the input that the university is supposed to contribute to academic freedom. Now we look, we look at the historical context in which higher education uh, has emerged or emerged in, the, in, in Africa. First of all, colonialism didn't have space for academic freedom. And as Cooper puts it, the idea of universities on the continent did not seriously enter the colonial imagination until quite late. And so until 1948, thereabouts, when the Ashby Commission was established and universities were established in the University of Ghana, Ibadan, Makerere, there were no universities properly so-called within the African context. Of course, you may talk about some few universities in North Africa, uh, the Furabe College in Sierra Leone, and some few in South Africa. But there is a context for these universities being present even though Tao not allow us to go into those details. So when colonialism became imminent, then there was a need to develop a Europeanized elite whose role and purpose was to maintain after colonialism the political economic framework put in place by the colonial enterprise which was leaving the scene, but not leaving the colonial structure itself. And so there had to be some people trained to run the affairs of the colonial enterprise alongside 
the new nationalist leaders that would come to power. So that was the, that was the history for the establishment of higher education in many African countries. And it is interesting to note that at the time of independence, Professor Akila Kwasoya counted only 18 universities that existed on the whole continent of Africa. Now, when these universities were established, interestingly, they were, their, their independence were tied to University of London and some few other universities, as well as the Inter-University Council, which was set up to regulate how these universities would function in terms of the staff, in terms of the curriculum, and in terms of even examinations. So it created some sort of suzerain relationship between the, the metropole and then the, the, the colonies. Now, at the same time, the Ashby Commission called for respect for academic freedom within these institutions, basically because the majority of the staff were academics and therefore uh, were Europeans, and therefore they needed that protection or respect for academic freedom. And the same was with um, the prescription was for all the universities that were established by the Ashby Commission. The conclusion is that at the time of independence, at the time of um, decolonization, and at the time of independence, the colonial universities remained colonized and needed to be decolonized. And this is how De Clerwig put it in his paper, The Emergent African University. African higher education was engaged in a process of disengagement from its past, or positively, in a search for an institutional identity with a pattern and objectives in accord with the realities of Africa. And so the process was Africanization or indigenization agenda. And I will argue that this was not, strictly speaking, a decolonization agenda but something different or something that just scratches the surface of decolonization. First, let us look at the three generations of constitution making so that we can situate the discussion in that context. The first generation of constitution making which took place in Africa led to the independence constitutions, which most of which were negotiated between the nationalist leaders and the departing colonialists. And it embraced democracy, liberal democracy, some respect for human rights, academic freedom, multi-party um, um, form of governance, and a few others. And for that matter, at the time of independence, African leaders also embraced academic freedom. You can refer to Nyerere, for example, who said, they must be torchbearers of our society, talking about academics, and the protectors of the flame should, should we, in our agency, endanger its brightness. So, Nyerere was in favor of academics, uh, academic freedom. So was Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana. He said, we know that the objectives of a university cannot be achieved without scrupulous respect for academic freedom. For without academic freedom, there can be no university. This is all well and good. But then came the second stage of constitution making in Africa. When a few years after, into independence, African states begin to jettison the the, the uh, first generation of constitution making which they had agreed with the departing colonialists. So then came in uh, governance concepts like African socialism, which led to one party system where you don't have dissents, all should belong to the one party, and there can be no state within the states. And so uh, this idea of African socialism went with what Pra calls the obsession with development, that African states wanted to develop. Uh, but Claude Ake says that we didn't have a, a development plan in place. We just wanted to harp on the concept of development because it was appealing to the masses. And this development agenda clashed with human rights because human rights was seen as a stumbling block to the realization of development. And so in this quest for rapid development, Kwame Nkrumah, for example, indicated that Africa, Ghana should be able to attain a development within a 10-year time frame to catch up with the, with the West. And so the university was to be incorporated into this development agenda and uh, were known as, um, or the concept of developmental universities emerged out of that. So if by uh, the fact that human rights was seen as a stumbling block to development, so was academic freedom. And so the, the attempt to 
fight against academic freedom began in that context. And CRM Lamini says, certain African leaders expect, expected more from universities than university autonomy and academic freedom. In particular, they emphasized that the university should contribute to development. However, this idea of developmental university and then the decolonization agenda could not work on three grounds. One, there was no attempt to decolonize the staff and the curriculum. And so it was just a lip service and it was just a political act. But in reality, decolonization wasn't pursued by African leaders. And certainly, you cannot pursue decolonization when the academics and students are not involved in the whole process. Secondly, there was no respect for academic freedom, as I said. And thirdly, there was a new level of coloniality which was imposed by African states, which is to ensure that they maintain their stranglehold on the universities, seeing that or by the fact that they see human rights as a, a stumbling block to development. And this is how Nkamdawira put it. He said, in many ways, African universities were born in chains. This is true of both those born in the colonial and post-colonial eras. In the post-colonial period, one set of chains was created by the dominant perceptions of, new, of the new authorities of what were the imperatives and exigencies of nation building and development. And so the university became recolonized and the, the decolonization agenda was abandoned. And decolonization simply became a speech act. And so it is in that context that even though there was some form of indigenization processes and Africanization attempts, it didn't constitute decolonization. Then there was attempts by academics and most importantly, students to fight back against the repressive regime or the coloniality and the recolonization of the university space. And so many examples abound. Human Rights Watch, for example, has done a good um, uh, analysis of this situation. But students' demonstrations, for example, in Khartoum led to the overthrow of uh, General Ibrahim Aboud. Um, in Senegal, the same thing in 1968. Leopold Senghor had to flee the capital, and he was almost dethroned by um, um, student demonstrations. So as a reaction to these attempts by the, the uh, students and academics to recapture the university space, the governments of the day it decided to tighten their grip on the universities. And so in, in countries like Sierra Leone, the government introduced party youth wings on the campuses in some places um, higher echelons of university administration was placed in the hands of um, government officials. And also, in some countries like Ghana and Kenya, students who had been admitted to the university had to be undergo ideological training before they would be admitted to the university so that they would become um, compliant to the wishes and dictates of the government of the day. And so, um, like I said, there was not much effort to promote decolonization. However, in some few instances, academics themselves took, the, took charge and decided to undergo, uh, sub, subject their countries to decolonization in that respect. So we have the situation in Kenya, for, where, for example, um, in, a, in, a, in an article by Ngugi Wationgo in 1972 on the abolition of the English department, he talked about how the English department was decolonized and the name even changed to literature department in order to allow for African scholars and their literary works to also be, to be taught at the university, which before then was not uh, possible. Then in the 90s, uh, late 80s, the World Bank came into the picture, the World Bank and the IMF, when it sought to control the economies of African states through the structural adjustment program and they indicated that university education was not relevant in Africa. And therefore, if African states needed an university, they can be trained abroad. But focus, the focus and attention should be on primary and secondary school education. In reaction, um, African leaders, um, sorry, Af African academics decided to organize a workshop in Kampala 
and they came out with the Kampala Declaration on Intellectual Freedom and Social Responsibility. Now, if you take a careful reading of the Kampala Declaration, which is considered a major contribution by African scholars to the promotion of academic freedom on the continent, so it is sad to note, however, that it didn't have a decolonization agenda. The emphasis was more about ensuring that the structural adjustment programs would not affect universities, and it was also to protect the, the, the pace of the academic. And it is interesting to note that there was little space for students' academic freedom to be recognized in this document, apart from one particular Article 7 um, in this document. So the idea of the Kampala Declaration was then to link the interest of the academics to the larger society in, in saying that academic democracy should not only be fought, um, should not be fought in the larger society alone, but academics should be part of it. And it's simply to indicate that it's because it also affected academics. Now, this will take us then to the third generation of constitution making in Africa. And that is after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union. The return, then it's this occasion, the return of democracy, human rights and academic freedom in Africa. And it is interesting to note that for the first time in the constitutional history of Africa, we had specific reference to academic freedom in 14 constitutions in Africa, which represents about 25%. Then in about eight of these constitutions, there was direct reference to some constituent elements of academic freedom. So whether it is respect for um, research, respect for knowledge production or dis dissemination, there was some reference to that in these constitutions. And so in, in all, um, there was about 50% uh, of African constitutions making reference to um, academic freedom in their constitutions, specifically or directly. Then there was also the retreat from the university space or the university management space by governments. Um, unfortunately, however, their place was taken by university management uh, administrators who were um, proxies or who acted as proxies for African governments in, man, in man, many African countries. So you can call that neocolonialism within the university space. Then we turn now to the situation in South Africa. Like I said, for um, geo-historical reasons, South Africa came late to the independence uh, party. It was not until 1994 when apartheid was abolished and the stage was set for um, democracy to reign. And as I said, democracy has links to academic freedom. But before then, in the 50s, when governments, uh, uh, the party government sought to control um, university admissions on racial grounds and other non-academic grounds, some scholars stood up and fought against that. T.B. Davy, for example, is remembered for having defined academic freedom in the university in this context, that there are four essential freedoms to determine for itself on academic grounds who, may, who the university may teach what may be taught, how it shall be taught, and who may be admitted to study. And in 1994, some academics at the universities of Wits uh, and University of Cape Town also supplemented the Davy definition of academic freedom by calling for the inclusion of the freedom for university teachers to teach and to pursue research freely, and freedom for students to debate old and new ideas freely. Looking at the academic landscape, as um, my colleague, uh, Professor Klaus, has indicated, based on the research work we did at the University of Lincoln, the research work we did indicated that African scholars had less interest in academic freedom, the pursuit of academic freedom issues, and more importantly, the decolonization agenda. But South Africa stood out in a number of ways. And there are a number of literature that can testify to this. For example, we have Kumalo S.H. having a paper on the decolonization as democratization, global insights into the South African experience. 
and Petro de Pries, whose work I also refer to in this work on decolonization and internationalization of university curricula. What can we learn from Rosie Bradotti? Then Melissa Stan, more recently in an edited work, Decolonizing the Mind, Reflections from Africa on Difference and Oppression. So the same trend uh, uh, can be found with respect to academic freedom in general. Um, but, and therefore, it's, it seems to draw a, a line between the, the commitment of scholars in South Africa to tackle issues of decolonization and um, um, academic freedom within the university space. Then we also have the student movement, the Follies movement, which began uh, around 2015, um, and which started as uh, uh, agitation for, for free education and so on, but culminated in calling for changes in higher education since the claim was that there has not been any change in higher education since apartheid. Then also for efforts to um, decolonize the unicentric, Eurocentric nature of the curriculum and also demand for free education for all. And we know how it led to the, the, um, the falling of statues like that of, that of Cecil Rhodes and others. However, what is interesting is that many universities in Africa did not identify with this movement. And even some records indicate that students from other African universities that were st studying in Africa at the time did not really show interest in this uh, movement. So the question is why? And how can we still go back and learn from the South African experience? Or to what extent can we learn from the South African experience? The wind of change that blew from South Africa was not replicated. And there could be different reasons for this. Um, one scholar talks about the fact that it coincided with the xenophobic attacks on Africans, other Africans in South Africa, which extended to African students. And, but I want to place a discussion in a larger context of coloniality. The fact that the question of decolonization emerged from different geohistorical moments across the African continent. For Africa, many, many other African countries, decolonization is no more a popular word. It is deemed as passe. Further, most African academics have little or no interest in academic freedom, as I've already indicated. They are only willing to challenge governmental authority where it is about their salaries, allowances, research grants, and so on, but not in the larger context of democracy um, for the sake of uh, democracy. And so in one of our publications with uh, Professor Klaus and um, Karan, titled Composite Theory, an African Contribution to the Academic Freedom Discourse, we talk about how the, the gown can go to town to promote democracy. Because if African academics should insulate itself on the university campus and only seek to promote or protect its own interests, then it will not be able to uh, promote the larger good of the society, which is part of what should be the agenda and the role of academics. But the question is, how can academics in African universities promote democracy in town when we don't practice democracy in the ivory tower? And this brings into question the issue of democratization of academic freedom, especially in our relationship with students, because the records also indicate that and this is based on a conference um, and other interactions with students and an article that has been written on this, which also indicates that a lot of um, um, professors don't have high regard for their students, and students also don't interact well with their lecturers for fear of the victimization. And so we can see a coloniality practice emerging in African universities where lecturers or academics want to have its way, uh, have their way over students. And so there's no, let, little or no attention to decolonization exercise because the decolonization exercise cannot be embarked upon by just one of the state stakeholders. Neither can the government on its own undertake it. It's a collective effort, or it should be a collective effort between academics, students, the university itself, working alongside with the government on their side, or working among these three actors to push government to be able to 
come along with it. Now, students and academics need to forge this relationship. And it, this can best be attained if the classroom is decolonized. And decolonizing the classroom is to say that students' academic freedom should not be treated as a byproduct of the protection of freedom of academics. Consequently, the classroom and the curriculum in most African countries, which remain colonized and leave students as the least beneficiaries of the academic freedom in Africa, should be reconsidered. The suppression of students' right to academic freedom denies them the right and opportunity to have a democratic engagement in the conduct of university affairs and in the way in which knowledge is produced and shared. And for that matter, the larger society becomes the losers of it. Because what the students learn or are, are treated to within the university space becomes what they take out from the university and begin to practice in their homes, in their families, in their communities, at the workplace, and into larger politics. And we have a trend in African universities where students, um, student leadership, or, or when you talk about student politics on the campus, it is no more like previously when it was targeted against governments and led to demonstrations and even toppling of some governments, but rather it is a co-opted form of relationship with governments where students want to use that space to be able to um, take a step into national politics. And therefore, the kind of politics that take place within the university space is not geared towards promoting the decolonization agenda or confronting uh, repression within the academic freedom space. Excuse me. Now, this brings me to the Another declaration, which was made by some scholars in Tanzania, called the Declaration of Academic Freedom and Social Responsibility of Academics, which actually preceded the Kampala Declaration, and which is a more progressive document, and which gives a lot of room and space for students to have their rights recognized and to be able to actually be engaged in the decolonization process. Unfortunately, though, the Kampala Declaration, which came a few months after the Dar es Salaam document, did not reference this document in detail, and therefore um, came up with a document which is, uh, if you like, a caricatured form of academic freedom document that we can be proud of. And so, uh, um, bringing my discussion to a close, I want us to re-examine the classroom the decolonization of the classroom and the curriculum. And the classroom, according to Dupriz, who is incidentally um, a lecturer here at Northwest University, that is the space for students and academics to use their agency to think, reflect, invent new knowledge. And we can also extend it to include, to challenge orthodoxy, to act on controversial matters and contradictory spaces encountered in higher education. Decolonizing the classroom is also to gain greater epistemological access by students and for students. It's also to empower students and involve them in the decolonization agenda. The curriculum, or decolonizing the curriculum, is also to involve the students in how a curriculum is designed and to bring their perspectives into the design and the, uh, the construction of uh, knowledge in that respect. So the curriculum, again, according to Dupriz, is not limited to what is written on paper, but extends to what we teach and do not teach for whatever reason, how we teach and why we teach in particular ways. So the student movement is certainly um, affected. And there's another leg of the decolonization uh, movement, which I want to mention in bringing my discussion to a close. And this is the third wave of colonialism, which is where African leaders have appropriated the vestiges of colonial power, which were left by the departing colonialists. And, and secondly, where they reproduce these powers. And thirdly, where they um, add an, a, a, another layer of coloniality on what it already exists and how it's, it's impacting on um, production of knowledge. And this knowledge is looked at in a larger sense of how 
Uh, for example, you talk about designing a, a human rights charter, such as the African Charter on Human Rights, which has been, when it came out, it is supposed to be a document that was supposed to have come out through um, the support of grassroots movements. But in the end, it, was, it came out as a document prepared by highly qualified experts. And we all know the defects and the challenges in the African Charter and how it has taken years of hard work by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights to make it a more acceptable document uh, in terms of um, uh, the progressive interpretation of some of the, of the defective provisions on human rights in the Charter, as well as using resolutions and declarations to be able to complement and to, to supplement the provisions in the, in the Charter, as well as even to come up with a number of protocols, such as on women's rights and then the, uh, the Charter on the rights and well-being of the children, to be able to make the human rights um, practice a more acceptable one in line with African uh, realities. And so on this call, we see that the declaration, the, 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 the declaration agenda has been abandoned, and this is affecting the ability of African states to be able to move ahead in the development of the African continent. And in, in, it is important, therefore, to refer to, for example, the Twilist School or the Twilist, which aims at deconstructing the colonial and imperial character of international law and using the Twilism, which is third world approaches to international law, as a tool to reconstruct a fairer world where African, Africans will be properly situated to be able to get a fair deal in trade relations and so on. And so it is time to question the universality of knowledge, which um, one scholar has termed it as Western epistemicide, that it is um, an attempt to denigrate and decimate knowledge produced from Africa and other non-European countries, and therefore to commit epistemic uh, injustice or violence. And therefore, the ideas of universality, which represents the European idea, or the Eurocentric idea, and therefore the element of neutrality and immutability of these concepts should not be something that should be acceptable. Therefore, um, talking about the knowledge economy, it is important to look at um, a cultural relativist approach to, to uh, the whole concept of knowledge production, so that it will allow for, it will challenge the universality idea and to allow for other ideas of human rights, especially uh, as an example, to be incorporated into the discourse. And it is not only in the area of human rights, but also even in technology. And for that matter, I want to quote Abeba Berhani, who has written um, an article on algorithmic colonization of Africa. And this is how he puts it. While traditional colonialism is driven by political and government forces, algorithmic colonialism is driven by corporate agendas. While the former used brutal force, colonialism in the age of AI takes the form of state-of-the-art algorithms and AI-driven solutions to social problems. Not only is Western developed AI unfit for African problems, the West algorithmic invasion simultaneously impoverishes development of local products, while also leaving the continent dependent on Western software and infrastructure. And this is all part of the epistemic um, injustices we're talking about. Therefore, there's a call for disruption or the construction of knowledge, not only through a well-ordered academic presentations, but from the vantage point of the daily realities of racial violence and encompassing the colonial and pan-African meanings, as one scholar uh, put it. But then the question also is how we can ensure that a cultural relativist approach will also not be hijacked by the, by the powers that be, because it has happened before and it seems to be happening again. Therefore, a cultural relativist approach should be actually grounded in the lived experiences of the people. It should genuinely reflect the aspirations and input of the oppressed people and the practical application of the concept should likely contribute 
towards the attainment of a, a sustainable development for the people on the ground. On that note, I want to end my discussion by saying that um, the students in, in, in South Africa, the scholars in South Africa, through the Follies movement especially, should set a, a tone to reignite the past student activism in other parts of the African continent and to generate a movement that will help democratize economic freedom and result in making the university relevant to the knowledge economy. So it is time to democratize academic freedom by properly locating the place of students and academics in the academic freedom equation to enable the colonization of the classroom and curriculum. This will then extend to democratizing the society and it will ensure that at the end of the day, African knowledge will be respected and it will find its proper place in ensuring that we use our indigenous development to also promote uh, human rights for, uh, and uh, development for the African continent. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kwajo PAJ Atua. Thank you for this uh, good speech, inspiring, telling us about the connections between decoloniality and academic freedom. We've got a good time now for questions and answers. And perhaps I'll use the opportunity to start the discussion, perhaps asking our uh, deputy Vice Chancellor, Research Innovation, if he perhaps has a question that he would like to pose uh, to Professor Kwajo. Not at this stage, so you can take the lead. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me also say uh, we have uh, a colleague of mine, Richard Kolabai, who is actually sitting on uh, the computer watching the Zoom chat. And um, have there been questions, Richard? Um, there is one raised hand, and well, there was one raised hand, and there is one question in the question and answer so far. Okay, um, we'll come to those in a second. I'll perhaps start by uh, addressing um, Professor Kwajo and referring to the research that we did when we were in Lincoln. We compared the degree of protection of the four elements that you mentioned. So it's the protection of university autonomy, individual freedoms, self-governance, and tenure in universities. So uh, while I looked at the European landscape, you looked at the African landscape. And you also classified countries according to how well they protect academic freedom. Can you perhaps just overall provide a sketch of, of your findings uh, in that regard and um, some of, some of the, the better candidates and some of the candidates that didn't do that well in the African context. Thank you. Yes, the, the research looked at these four elements, the um, institutional autonomy, uh, freedom for academics and students. Um, we also looked at the self-governance issue and tenure. And we relied on questionnaire that was posted. We also did research online, looking at the constitutions of African countries, looking at existing laws, looking at university practices uh, to be able to identify um, which of the, the, the five elements stood out among the, the countries that were were able to have access to the information that we, we looked at. And the, we looked at this also in the context of the relationship between democracy and academic freedom. And it was established that where the, how democratic a state is actually also determines the level of respect for academic freedom. And there were some countries that um, stood out. For example, you can talk about um, Ghana, talk about um, Sao Tome and Principe, talk about South Africa, um, 
We talk about um, um, some other countries in um, East Africa, I think Kenya, and so on. That did quite well. However, we need to indicate that this research work was more based on what is actually in the law books than what is actually pertains in practice. Yeah, so um, the next stage of the work, which we are looking at, the possibility of funding, is to examine what is in the law books and what actually takes place on the ground. But it's important to note that we looked at, identified three categories of um, 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 ranking. The first is free in terms of whether the democratic credentials and academic freedom um, indicators match. And then um, um, less free and then, I mean, I mean partially free and not free. And so we're able to identify that the majority of African states actually fall within the partially free space. And uh, um, the, the, then followed by the, the not free, and then the, the free states are the least numbers that we, we able, were able to indicate in the survey. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe uh, we'll turn to one of the questions from the chat. Great, thank you so much. Um, so she was asked in the chat, on the topic of decolonizing African, uh, or rather academic knowledge, how come decolonizing academic knowledge is only spoken and emphasized at higher education le level, yet at primary and secondary level is not emphasized? At high school, I learned about European history and not history about Africa. My question is, what strides are done to decolonize basic education? Should I respond individually or we put them together? I think you can okay. respond to that. We've got plenty Very well. Well, um, the decolonization agenda is certainly not limited to the um, higher education level. However, when we are talking about linking it to academic freedom, academic freedom is largely um, recognized in the context of higher education because here you're talking about um, knowledge production, uh, knowledge production that is then supposed to be disseminated and applied within the larger society. Of course, the um, UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights uh, recognizes that academic freedom is not only limited to higher education space, but it can also come down to uh, secondary level, uh, at least a secondary level. And so that is not to limit academic freedom to the university space, neither decolonization, but it has to start from somewhere. And we think that um, if you are talking about knowledge production, it takes place at the academic, uh, at the tertiary level. And so if that tertiary space is decolonized, then it can impact and it cascade down to the lower levels. And so that is the idea why the, the decolonization process will start from there. Because um, even if you look at the university um, um, graduates that were churned out by the, the uh, colonial universities, they were mainly teachers who were formed part of it as well as administrators. And the teachers are supposed to go and then go and teach. So if these teachers are trained to um, um, decolonize the curriculum, then the, the books and works that they are going to produce will also be, be decolonized in that respect, and it will all promote the bigger agenda of decolonizing the whole academic space. Um. We yesterday spoke about certain developments that are taking place in your home country of Ghana, where the government also plans certain reforms of the higher education sector. Uh, what are these plans? Uh, will they be implemented? And what would they mean for academic freedom? Yes, that is a very good point. You know, in my discussion, I was talking about the fact that um, when the third stage of constitution making emerged in Africa after the fall of the Berlin Wall, academic freedom was recognized in a number of African countries' uh, constitutions. And Ghana was one of them. If you look at Article 21.1b of the constitution, it specifically recognizes academic freedom as part of um, freedom of expression. And um, one would have expected that there would be efforts to ensure that this recognition of this particular uh, freedom will be duly respected. 
And in fact, the Constitution goes on to talk about, for example, the fact that the president, while in office, cannot be a chancellor. The Constitution also talks about the fact that even though the president is supposed to appoint chairmen and chairpersons or boards and so on, the president's power does not extend or should not extend to the appointment of um, um, chairpersons of university councils in order to preserve that autonomy. Okay, so these measures were put in the, in the Constitution not for nothing, but to ensure that academic freedom was properly protected. Now, in the case of the University of Ghana, for example, after the constitution came into being, after a few years after the constitution had come into place, new statutes were created, which allowed for the chairperson of the council to be appointed by the university system. Previously, it was done by the president and, uh, or the military ruler of the time and so on which was quite progressive. But then we had a new statute, uh, a new act which came up in 2010. And that uh, law itself or act recognized the fact that that position to be appointed by the president. And therefore it went on to indicate in the new statute that also came up that that should be the case by reference to Article 70 of our constitution, which in actual fact doesn't refer to um, university councils, but rather to um, a higher education commission that is supposed to regulate relations among the universities. Now, as if that was not enough, and we have been challenging that position anyway, uh, but as if that is not enough, um, last two years, the government decided to come up with a public university bill. And this public university bill was to create one bill or law that will regulate um, about 20 or so public universities together. Um, and the government gave reasons for why they needed this law. For example, it said that there was undue bureaucracy and, and other factors such as misappropriation of funds, but which in actual facts have not been proven to be true. And so there had to be a concerted effort by investors, public universities to fight this bill. And fortunately, we were able to make cases that the, the provisions in the bill were unconstitutional, they were unnecessary, and they would give too much powers to even the Minister of Education to make to issue directives that would be binding. And uh, for example, the council, the university council, the membership of the council was inflated such that appointment, government appointees can form a quorum and on their own make decisions for the university. And so, fortunately, we were successful in that fight, and the bill had to die with the then parliament, which, whose work expired at the end of 2020. However, there is that fear that this law may still come back because there have been other laws and uh, tertiary policy documents which still reference some of these provisions which were in the university bill. That is um, what we and have in Ghana today. When you pursue such work, uh, do you sometimes personally fear for life and limb when you, you know, political persecution? Well, fortunately, Ghana hasn't got to that stage yet, or hopefully we wouldn't get to that stage. But of course, there are, there are always attempts by uh, government propaganda and so on to um, present a different side of the picture and also try to divide, to divide the front of the University Teachers Association. And so that is the tactics that normally the government plays to ensure that our work would not be able to progress. I, I recall that I came to your university in 2017 and that we had a workshop there uh, with um, uh, various scholars from West African countries. And um, as the outcome, we had a communique on academic freedom. What has happened to that? Has that ha had any beneficial effect in the West African countries? And if not, why not? Well, unfortunately, that communique has not had any impact on the uh, um, academic freedom space in West Africa because the participants, unfortunately, did not propagate the message and also did not put into practice the the, the beautiful ideas we put together to form the communique. 
And it comes down back to the point I was making that um, African scholars largely don't show interest in academic freedom issues. And it's also about the fact that we don't really understand what we mean by academic freedom and what academic freedom can do for the good of our own research activities. And especially in this time and age when we're talking about excuse me, research institutions and knowledge production and trying to challenge um, orthodoxy and um, the imposition of Western knowledge in the, in the universities. So I think it's time that we really revisit such communiques and also make sure that um, there is that organized effort to um, ensure that decolonization of the mind, decolonization as a, a subject is actually taught in African universities and uh, probably right at the beginning of uh, admission of new students into the university, such a course will be organized and taught to the students so that right from the beginning they will know that as students they, they have these rights and as part of the academic community they can challenge um, authority whether from the university or from the academics so that it will create that level playing field for them to properly play their role in the academic yes. freedom uh, struggle. I think that is very important to emphasize that academic freedom is not just a matter for staff, it's also a matter of for students. And you had an article published in uh, the African Journal of Human Rights on that recently. Uh, Richard, is there another question from the chat? Um, yes, there are a few more. Yes. Um, so first from uh, Narendt. Uh, thank you for the provocative and thoughtful lecture, Professor. How would you propose that we build solidarity and a common agenda across the continent to achieve the vision you have set out to democratize academic freedom? Yes, thank you for the question. It's, it's, it's a big ask, but we, we, the point is that we cannot progress if we neglect um, the space that we African scholars need to contribute to academic freedom or to need to contribute for the larger well-being of the society. And so what it needs to be done is, for example, by setting up networks such as we wanted to develop with the West African um, um, Scholars Program. And I think that it is important at this stage to follow the example of South Africa as I tried to um, submit in my presentation, that the idea of decolonization should be captured and be promoted at every university level. The idea of setting up um, a sort of Magna Charter as we have in Bologna for European, of course, it's not only for European um, universities, but it's a European idea. Africa should have a similar um, um, system in place, whereby we're able to bring together ideas on academic freedom. We bring to the, together different documents that have come out on academic freedom. We talked about the Kampala Declaration. We talked about the Dar es Salaam one. We talked about, there's also the Juba one and the communique that we also issued at this West Africa Forum and, and many other um, ideas that should be brought to the table so that we all agree to a common pact among vice chancellors. We need the cooperation of vice chancellors. For example, when we're doing this um, um, research in, in, at Lincoln, some vice chancellors wrote specifically to say that I don't want my investors to take part in this research, which is a, a, a demoralizing um, um, uh, attempt. And so vice chancellors need to come together on this process. We also need to talk about the um, Association of African Universities, which has diplomatic status in almost every Af African country. But unfortunately, the Af Association of African Universities would not cooperate with us when we're doing this research work because we sent through them. They have uh, so many students, um, universities that are part of this network. So we wanted to use them as a basis to reach out to these universities, but unfortunately the response was very poor. But this institution has a very vital role to play to even solicit research funding to do research on academic freedom and decolonization in Africa and the uh, findings disseminated through conferences and workshops and so on. And I think that is the way uh, Africa needs to go and should be the new agenda for, for Africa going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Richard? Um, Livio asks, uh, the idea of democratizing academic freedom to decolonize higher education is powerful. 
What should be the nature of such an endeavor, primarily political, legal, or eventually epistemological? I think it should, it should touch on all of these um, um, bases, legal, epistemolo epistemological, and um, the, uh, the other ones you talk about, even culturally, because when we're talking about um, um, democratizing academic freedom, of course, we are seeing that it starts at the university level, where all the three major players are allowed to play a role. But at the end of the day, the society has an important role to play in this. At the end of the day, the government also has an important role to play in this. So when the, 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 the flame is lit at the university level, with all these three actors coming together, decolonizing the classroom, decolonizing the curriculum, the government, for example, has to come in because at the end of the day, we have accreditation boards that should review and accept courses to be run at the university level. The, academic, um, uh, the, the accreditation board should come on board. Then we're also talking about the fact that at the end of the day, there is indigenous knowledge that can be harnessed by connecting to um, the society, by connecting to, for example, traditional authorities, by connecting to um, opinion holders in the society, and so on. And we need to solicit this information from them, which research can then be done for it to be incorporated into the teaching curriculum at the university level. And so it is, it is a project which may start at the university level, but at the end of the day, government has to come along because laws need to be passed to make them work. And much as to some extent, uh, there can be university practices through statutes which may work. That may not achieve much impact. So yes, democratization of academic freedom is a gateway to decolonizing the curriculum. And it's a broad-based approach that needs to be employed to be able to realize this goal. I think that the last uh, question came, came from Professor Livu Matai, right? Yes. Yes, uh, le let me just welcome him actually uh, to the lecture. He's from the Central uh, European University, yes. which has itself been the victim of academic uh, freedom threats in Hungary and actually had to move to uh, Vienna. So uh, Professor Matai knows exactly what he is uh, talking about. Is there further questions? Um, yes, I think there's one or two more. Um, Adamu asks, uh, Nkrumah had to abandon his PhD in the UK because his supervisors wanted him to make some changes in his thesis, which he vehemently disagreed with. What is your take on students who critique their lecturers or have different opinions? And how can we encourage that space in the classroom as we aspire to decolonize knowledge production? Yes, I think it's, it's um, uh, I know about the Nkrumah story, and I think it's important that um, students are not just seen as consumers of knowledge, but students should be seen as also as producers of knowledge. For so long, we have seen the, invest, uh, the invest, uh, students as passive recipients of knowledge. But that has not helped us. I think for, for, for that to change, academics should just see themselves as not the sole um, um, depo repositors of knowledge, and therefore what they give us to students should be the, the, the final uh, piece. And so we should, it's important to actually move away, for example, from the examination approach, um, uh, end of semester exams approach of examining students. We should, for example, look at how we can allow students to produce papers critical of the works of academics and to pick from this and to be able to incorporate them into what we teach. It is important to give students the opportunity to influence the curriculum by giving them the curriculum, giving them the scope of the subject, asking them about the expectations for the course, and then seeing the extent to which they can come back and say, I think that this topic should be interesting. For example, in my uh, second semester international human rights course, it is the students that determine the topics that need to be taught on contemporary human rights issues. Some will say, let's talk about um, um, child rights. Let's some will say LGBTQI rights. Some will say uh, women's rights. Some will say women's rights in the context of um, and the rural woman and, and the ability to, you know, understand what is meant by feminism and so on. So I think that is a way to go so that um, you also allow the students to critique 
what they see about um, um, the everyday occurrences of what they learn in the classroom, apply it in the, in, in, in the, in the um, public space, and then come back, reflect, and see what can be done with this knowledge and how they can change things. And to say that, probably, Professor, you taught us, you taught us this topic. You, you indicated that this way, that way, things can work. We've gone to the market, we realize that the, 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 the market woman does things very differently. So how can you learn from the market woman? When it is, whether it is about economics um, uh, or human rights or rights of women, then we can generate that discussion to ensure that that knowledge sharing is there. And then we also there's a need to um, support students in their, in their publication work. Sometimes the work is rather appropriated by um, academics, and sometimes the student is not even referenced at all. Sometimes even at all, they may be in the footnotes, or uh, they may be recognized at best as a second in the line of the, of the contributors to the, to the discussion. But it is time that we make sure that we, we give that space for students to experiment. About, after all, that is the essence of knowledge, and that's how we acquire knowledge. So through this experimentation, they are guided, and then they come up with relevant literature. And also to ensure that, finally, to ensure that when they produce their dissertations, we don't shelve them and let um, dust consume them. But we rather make sure that we find, they find their way into um, um, pu published works, and they also find their way into sharing the information with the media, um, and to particular ministries based on where the work has, is related to, and to ensure that we put them into practice. Through this way, we're encouraging the students to think deeper beyond what is just taught in the classroom, which they are just supposed to um, uh, memorize and re regurgitate, but rather to be able to think about it and not just say, oh, that's what the professor said, but to say, is that what the professor said? And even to say, this is what the professor said, so what? Let me, let me bring out my alternative views on the subject. Is there another question? Um, yes, uh, Nicodemus uh, raised the hand a long time ago, um, but uh, it just hasn't been visible for uh, a while now. I don't know if we were able to get them unmuted. Hello? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, Uh, it, the, 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 the power, the influence of the West on African states is so powerful. Let's take uh, Francophone states where even the currency is uh, controlled by France and any recalcitrant leader is moved from power. How can we decolonize our thinking the classroom when the head of state depends on another power? Uh, I am also worried by the fact that you are handing over the leadership of the decolonization process of South Africa. Decolonization started just yesterday in South Africa after the fall of uh, apartheid as a narrative. In West Africa, decolonization is, is quite long. You know, it started in the late 50s. So what qualifies South Africa to, to lead the rest of Africa in the discourse? And the, my last question is, um, I am confused by your usage of uh, decolonization and decoloniality. You seem to give the impression that decolonization is de passé. And uh, my thinking is that decolonization and decoloniality were conceptualized in different contexts and continents. So uh, how can we uh, all of a sudden feel that Decoloniality is, is uh, 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 decolonization is, is a passé, and uh, decoloniality is a la mode. I, I don't really uh, uh, that. Uh, thank you very thank much. You thank you very much. much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, let, let me correct some um, comments you made, which I don't think was how I put it. First of all, um, I said decolonization is passé 
not be, not as a concept itself, but I said in the context of the fact that um, apart from the South African experience, uh, there's not much talk about decolonization within the larger um, the rest of Africa, and I attribute to the fact that it's because of the geo historical context that we had um, independence in the 60s. Most of Africans had independence in the 60s. South Africa had it later on in 1994 when the first democratic elections were held. So the idea of decolonization has therefore uh, seemed to have been uh, passed, come and gone, and things are now have now been normalized. But the, the decolonization process itself still remains uh, something that is waiting to be harnessed and to be used to ensure proper decolonization because the fact that we are independent states politically doesn't mean that we are independent economically and in the, in the um, epistemological sense and in many other contexts. And so if you pick any subject, whether it is philosophy, whether it is um, international relations, whether it is human rights, whether it is international law, anthropology, those areas where, um, for example, I personally, my work touch, you, uh, uh, my, my work touch, the, the, you, you understand that the decolonization issue has not gone. And therefore, there's a need for us to, to speaking as academics, to be able to bring it back to the table and ensure that it is actually carried forward to the next level and made part of the, 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 the foundation of our quest for development. I made the point that Africans is we're talking about developmental universities, but that developmental agenda could not be carried on where the university itself remained colonized and where academic freedom was not part of the agenda and where African states were compiling other layers of coloniality onto the, uh, to the, to the, um, to the political process as it existed at the time and even as it exists today. Okay, so in that sense, decolonization has not come to an end. Okay, now on the other issue of um, decolonization having been active in the past, in other parts of Africa, it is true, but um, I dare say that while there were challenges to governmental authority in a number of countries, especially in the 60s and 70s, and also around the time of such adjustment in the um, um, late 80s and 90s, the focus was not on decolonization connected to my second point of um, coloniality, which is colonization of the mind, okay, which therefore calls for decolonization of the classroom, of knowledge, of um, curriculum. Okay, and so that is where, to me, the, the, the attention should be placed because that defines a number of things that we talk about. We're talking about international law, for example. International law remains colonized, it remains imperial, and the ideas in there are said to be universal and immutable. We have to accept it as it is. But we all know how international law is, even when we're talking about um, changes in government, unconstitutional changes in government in Africa today. International law has a role to play in terms of recognition of governments. The AU as we speak today has not been able to articulate a position of recognition of governments in such a way that it can help in deterring people from uh, uh, um, misru um, misruling their countries and also to deter people from changing government through unconstitutional means. So to me, that is where the, the process should begin from, and that is the, my focus of attention, but not decolonization generally, which I think, if you are putting in that context, then we can say that uh, um, South Africa should not be an example. But looking at um, the current discussion in this context of uh, the epistemological network we're talking about, it is South Africa that has shown the lead both from the side of academic writing and in terms of the, the fullest movement by students. Thank you. Oh, okay, uh, thank you. We are approaching the end of the lecture. I think uh, I should ask a last question. And um, now I perhaps sometimes think that although we in South Africa do not face what I term the academic freedom violations 1.0, 
we do have a problem of academic freedom violations 2.0, and that consists in the commercialization of higher education and the idea that uh, higher education should promote economic development. Higher education becomes the long arm of uh, economic development. And, and, and in that sense, perhaps South Africa is they not so different from the other African states. Perhaps the, the ways used here are a bit different. But we should remember that the present Higher Education Act and the way the higher education scene is structured is actually the result of an ANC government. So it, is, it has been decided on by a democratic uh, country. And so I, I fear sometimes, you know, you may know this famous painting by Edward Munch, which is like uh, called the scream and the person that kind of holds his ears because he feels it's becoming too much. And I uh, sometimes see like a hyper-performativity in high, higher education, which is perhaps um, the result of this idea that we must produce for the world out there. And so coming back to the quotation of Akhil Mbemba, I read it out once more, and maybe you wish to comment on that. He says, we need to decolonize the systems of university management. We have to create alternative systems of management because the current ones, dominated by statistical reason and the mania for assessment, are deterring students and teachers from a free pursuit of knowledge. They are substituting this goal of free pursuit of knowledge for another, to the pursuit of credits. So, after all, uh, the idea of maybe a free university, but the university ruled uh, uh, based on principles of neoliberal thinking, is it perhaps also actually a university that needs further decolonization? So are we also a victim of a colonized system in South Africa? Yes. Um, the fact that I use the South African example doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's uh, a perfect system or it doesn't have its weaknesses and gaps and challenges. But I'm using it in the context of the fact that some scholars have stood up, have realized the defects. You know, when we're talking about human rights, human rights are not just given on the plate and say, take it. You fight for it, you get it, and then you, you continue fighting to protect it. And so if there had not been any problem in the South African system, I don't think scholars would have risen up to uh, call for decolonization of the classroom and so on. So, so that indicates that. There's a problem in the South African system. That is part of it is what Akil Mbebe is talking about. But the fact that South African scholars, students have risen up to challenge that uh, system indicates that they, they want a change. And that is the same clarion call I want to issue to other African countries that it is time we also stood up against the system in our own countries. The managerialism and so on is creeping into um, many African countries as well. And so when we speak up without uh, and, and doing away with the self-censorship and the fact that we may even want the government to give us some political position and therefore we don't want to criticize, then that becomes a major weakness in our fight to uh, promote the larger interests of the society. And as the composite theory we, 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 talked, we, we discussed and uh, postulated indicates, we, the, 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 the um, um, the academics, the intellectual class, need to shed off the gown and go to town and make sure that the space that we have, which is more privileged, will not be used for ourselves only, but rather we, 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 we take into account the larger interests of the society and, and, and fight on their behalf. Thank you, Professor Kwajo Apiaj Atua. Uh, it was a privilege to have you here to actually travel to South Africa as we are about to resume a more normal style of life with people having been vaccinated. So this was a hybrid event, although our uh, audience was actually essentially a digital audience. Nonetheless, I would just like to use the opportunity to give a small present to Professor Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to have you here. And thank you for everyone who attended this lecture. And we'll be back next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>